uh, privilege to have a chance to talk to Stefan Feuchtwang, who I've known over the years. Stefan, tell me where and when you were born. I was born in Berlin in 1937, November. My father had just come out of jail, where he had been tried, for, uh, after he had been tried and found not guilty for his having, uh, and he was accused of smuggling gold out of the country, uh, which was, I think, uh, because he'd been helping Jews leave Germany. And um, he had Austrian nationality, so he had a certain amount of immunity, and it wasn't for under the SS, it was just the ordinary law, the police law. And he had an alibi that he stuck to so well that he um, got off, whereas his co accusees didn't. Anyway, that's How long was he in jail? Just, uh, just so Most of my mother's pregnancy, which made it very distressful. For mm. um, and she, she. So I had a very traumatic birth for her, not for me. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and six months later, um, at Anschluss, that's the annexation of Austria, my father knew that he had no longer any immunity. He said, we leave tonight on that day. And he was right, because uh, we went to Holland to his sister, where she was living. And the Gestapo came the next morning to round us up, but we weren't there any longer. So then I came to... We spent a year in Holland and then to London. Exactly. Okay, let's let's go back a little bit because um, it's always rather interesting to hear about people's family a bit further back as anthropologists, mm -hmm. ancestors. Um, did you know any of your grandparents at all? Never. No, I didn't. <coughs> only my mother's mother mm -hmm. called Muttel. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I called her Muttel. Mm -hmm. um, and she I knew because... Uh, she had come to visit us in London, so I knew her from very early on. And then she returned, believe it or not, to Germany where she knew what was happening. Um, and she spent the war there. My mother was not, she had a Jewish father, but her, her mother was not Jewish, so Miss Mutter was not Jewish. And she went back to Berlin and then lived out the war, actually in Austria for the last few years. But so she, I knew, and I knew her afterwards because in 1947 we went, my mother and I, my first big trip to by train to Switzerland and then Austria, where we met my grandmother. So she, I knew, but my other grandparents, I didn't ever know. What was the on those two sides, the main sort of occupation. Uh, my my f grandfather, my father's father, was the chief rabbi of Vienna. Really? But he'd already died. He died in '36. Mm. Um, and a, a natural death. I mean, mm. no persecution. Um, and I went to visit his grave in Vienna at the European Association of Social Anthropologists meeting when he was there mm. um, uh, for the first and only time. But I'd been to see, visit his father's grave, who was mm. the, who was the rabbi of a place called Nikolsburg, that's now called Mik Mikolov. It's in the, it's in Moravia, not, not very far from Vienna. Um, and so that's what they were, um, sort of rabbis, at least up to two generations before my father, and. Um, it's not good to admit this for an anthropologist, but I don't know what my what what my grandfather's wife, my grandmother, mm -hmm. did. Um, my mother's mother was a very independent woman, whom I sort of take as a kind of heroine. Um, she was a pacifist and a Rosa Luxemburgist in the First World War. She ran an art gallery in other in Linden, you know, the big avenue. In Berlin, um, and brought up all her children to be, 
basically tolerant and uh, cosmopolitan, and gave each of them a, an Aryan and a, and a biblical name to sort of mix the. Uh, she, she, she was very oddly keen, as people of that generation were, to know what the real history of Shakespeare was. <laughs> um, so that, that was her, and her husband, she had two husbands. But her, my mother's father was a solicitor, no, what was he, um, a businessman, and then she remarried a, the solicitor for the Ufa film studios in Berlin. So that's mm. their occupation. My mother um, then, my, my father was a businessman mm. and came to England through his business contacts. What kind of business? Patent broker, I, I knew it as a, I'm trying not to say it by rote, but I knew it as a child. A patent broker and an industrial advisor. <laughs> um, and he, so he, he, he brokered patents, mm. uh, and so he had contact with scientists, but um, mainly he'd been quite successful in Germany as an asset stripper, as I, I now call it, yeah. uh, working for somebody who bought up other places and he calculated them whether or not they were worth keeping and the rest of the strip. Um, mainly in Eastern, what we now call Eastern Europe, Central Europe. Um, and, and he came to this country and he went on doing business. But during the war he was interned and uh, my mother built up a relationship with another person, another man, um, who was a publisher and with whom she got a job. Um, and they became the founders of the firm Thames and Hudson, the publishing firm. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And um, tell me something about their character, um, <laughs> your mother and father's character, well, my personality, etc. Well, my father was quite authoritarian, but extremely charming. So that as a child, I, I sort of have, because I've had three children, grandchildren, several of them, seem to have a, an, uh, an affinity with babies. I mean, I get on well with babies. <laughs> and I think I get that from my father, because I think he must have had two. I certainly know that my mother did not get on well with babies. So when I had my children and then her children, um, I could see how awkward she was with, with, with young children. I thought, that's odd. She must have been that with me too, I suddenly realized. Mm. So she, he was charming and uh, entertaining and then very authoritarian after a certain age. I could see that with my, he married again too, and so uh, with, his, with my half brother and sister, you could see that happening. Mm. Um, and I rebelled against his authority, I have to say, although I didn't spend much time at home. I was at boarding school all my childhood. Um, but the, the, um, and sort of distanced myself from him and only came close to him again when I became a young adult and did get very close to him again before he had died. He died quite early in 1966. Um, um, so he was only 67 years old. Uh, my mother lived on much longer, and I lived with her as a child, although I was at boarding school. They lived, in, they separated. Back. And she was a, she's a, a much more passionate, um, not quite bohemian, but everything that we tried to do as children, she said, oh, we did that in the 1920s. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the, uh, that sort of, uh, but also very passionate about her work and about, um, almost everything. She was also extremely fashionably well dressed and became a fairly grand lady, though I only sort of cottoned on to that. To me, she was just my mother. But, the, but as a full adult, I suddenly realized this is someone other people are rather frightened of. And I wasn't. Um, and so she's. I, I guess I was closer to her than. The, that's the difference in their character. My father, I felt, in England, was a, 
a fairly sad figure. I mean, my mother found herself. She had been, as it were, um, in Germany, enthralled to her, to, to him. But in England, she found herself, and so she blossomed. Whereas my father, I felt, shrank. I mean, he'd had to put up with so much, including jail, but also having to get us to England, and then being interned in the Isle of Man, and, which he quite enjoyed in the end. He went into the army. But he, I felt, as a businessman, he'd been defeated. Hmm. Were you brought up with any orthodox um, trappings? Or? Yes, I was. Yes, good you asked. Oh. Um, do you have a bar mitzvah? And I did. I had an orthodox bar mitzvah. That's precisely, hmm. <laughs> precisely it. But it was a sort of a short period of my life. I went to, um, I went to lessons, Hebrew lessons in the town where my boarding school was near, Welling Garden City. And I went to a rabbi there to learn Hebrew and the, and the Torah that I had to read uh, for my bar mitzvah from a rabbi unbelievably known. Unbelievably, his name is pronounced Rabbi Scripture. Scripture? But it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's written in a Polish way. <laughs> um, and, and he... he um, and, and so, yes, I did a, an orthodox bar mitzvah. And, but habitually in the family, it was just Friday evenings. Hmm. Um, but while I was three years before and possibly the two years after my bar mitzvah, I did go to the high days and holidays to synagogue, but otherwise I didn't go at all. And I, hadn't, I didn't before and I haven't since. So I'm an atheist, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we'll come on to that mm -hmm. further. Um, I mean, uh, several of the people who I've interviewed who have been Jewish hmm. have commented on the fact that they felt that this did give them an odd view of life, that they felt both within society and outside it at the same time. Um, and Simon Chapa says this, and then when I put it to Lisa Jardine, she said, well, that's, a, that's so often said, it's a sort of cliché. It, it may be true. It may be true. Did you... Yes, I, 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 did, I felt that I had to interpret everything. I mean, I went to school, all of which were mainly Christian schools, and um, so when we were read a lesson in the school services on every day, actually, and that um, I, I, I felt. It wasn't necessarily mine, but I could try to understand it. And when I think about you know, why I'm now an anthropologist of ritual and religion, or when I, that I became that, amongst other things, I I feel that it was a it was a it was a development of that stance that I had to I had to I had to try to understand something that wasn't part of my family ritual, as it were. And then, of course, I had to understand my family ritual, too. But the, the, that, in that sense of feeling marginal. But, of course, being of German birth during the war in England, made, I mean, Jewish or not, hmm. was, was, was to be marginalized. And hmm. I was quite embarrassed uh, when my mother spoke to me in German in public, on public transport, for instance. I, 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 I told her to shut up. I mean, I was quite fierce. Um, but I did. I only realized it actually many, many years later in my 40s that I must have been German speaking before I had learned English. So, before I went, I mean, when, as soon as I went to kindergarten, which was pretty early, mm. I had to learn English. Mm. Mm. I mean, it's, it was said by, among others, Evans Pritchard, that uh, when asked why the list of candidates for the professorship at Cambridge consisted entirely of Jews and Catholics, uh, <laughs> he, he said, uh, I'm afraid, gentlemen, that's because all the good anthropologists are Jewish or Catholic, yes. um, which is, to a certain extent, there's something in it. I mean, do you think, you've sort of alluded to it, but do you think um, that... that being brought up in a 
great religious tradition did later attract you towards understanding? No. I think it's the marginality. Mm. I, I, but even that I'm, I, I think all anthropologists to some extent cultivate being marginal um, and maybe already inclined in that direction anyway. And politically, I'm fairly much a political animal. I think that, and that the normal stance, insofar as it is political of an anthropologist, is to be an anarchist. Is to be a an anarchist. Oh, right. you know, to see things from the grassroots mm. and, and to hope that there's nothing else if possible. <laughs> um, the, 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 and that, in a way, is, is, is not to be in the center, but to be um, below or at the edge. And I think, and that, I don't know if I was predisposed towards that by my, I mean, that, that I was predisposed by, I think, my previous life. I'm, I'm talking about my previous life <laughs> before I became an anthropologist. Yeah. And the, the um, but not, I don't know that. I mean, it, I don't, I really don't know enough to see whether I'm typical or not of the histories of other anthropologists of religion, which is what I consider myself to be. Um, the, I, but I do consider it that I'm, I felt I needed to understand something as an outsider. That is that were these big religious traditions, including my own. So I didn't feel that much inside it, because I rebelled against my father. I, you know, it's it's a. But on the other hand, I felt very much at, at home. In fact, it was a way of making home. Those Friday evenings where I had to do the prayer for the breaking bread, and my mother did the lighting of the candles, and my father did the wine. You know, I mean, it's that. That, that family occasion that seem very seems very important now, and I think it was then. Um, but again, it was a kind of hidden presence. My, I mean, my public life and most of my life was in boarding school, where where this was edged out. You know, this was not to be wasn't to be part of it. Returning just to two points there, one is on anarchy. Mm. Uh, I was thinking of Anarchy Brown, which was yes, quite <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, Radcliffe Brown's yes. nickname. But it's often said that anthropologists are anarchic and radical in their own societies because they question everything about it. Yes. But in the societies they work in, they become very conservative and preserving the traditions, kind of thing. Mm. Is that at all true of you or not? Yes, I, I have to admit it is. Um, the I mean, what I loved in the end uh, about the festivals that I became most interested in, in Taiwan, um, and which I then followed through other parts of China, um, is the, the, their exuberance and in some ways their, um, the, the colorfulness and the extraordinary richness of of both of invention and of and of the fact that they repeat. And so when um, I come upon the fact that I have to take into consideration that uh, um, intellectuals or political leaders or cultural policy in both Taiwan and the mainland of China seek to turn this into cultural heritage. I sort of, I acknowledge that that's what they're trying to do, but I also resent it. It's, it's because I, I, I'd like it, as it were, to bubble up from below as a kind of, as I like to think of it, an anonymous poetry, collective poetry of some kind. And um, of course it's not anonymous. Mm. People, you know, you can actually know who, who actually introduced this particular ritual if it's more it's quite recent, but in some ways it's more it's embedded in whatever there already was. Whereas when it's um, reinvented or recomposed as cultural heritage, 
um, as a spectacle or as um, a, when a temple is rebuilt as something that tourists can go to, which is quite often done by the temple or management committee themselves. Um, I feel it's wrong, but I do feel that it's 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 artificial. Mm. Um, and I and well, I know it's wrong, but I, it's it's uh, you know it's no more artificial than the previous one was. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> the the other question arising, I mean, you you threw away the fact that you are an atheist. Mm. Um, have you ever been anything otherwise? And at what age did you know you were an atheist? I think I always was. I had to ask myself, what is God, all the time? Mm -hmm. um, what do people mean by God? But I'm deeply respectful, as well as utterly sceptical, of some of what people say, they um, have as their spiritual experiences, including what they say about God or gods. Mm. I, I have a preference for polytheism, <laughs> um, but the the um, I I don't. I, I'm, I come from a psychoanalytically inclined family culture. I mean, my mother was psychoanalyzed, did graphology, which is a, psycho, a Jungian uh, mode, and I'm married to someone who is a psychoanalytic therapist, and she was, her mother was a psychoanalyst. So it, it's, it's, as it were, around me. And what Freud calls an oceanic experience, one of his descriptions of what it is to, to have uh, to, to, to have religiosity or to have the emotion that is that goes along with a belief in God. Um, I think I can detect that in myself. You know, I think I can. I can. You know, I don't know. Whether, I've never had an epiphany, mm. but but I but oceanic experiences, mm. if you like, a sense of wonder. As the arch the, um, atheist Richard Dawkins himself has mm. um, a sense of wonder about the world mm. and the sense of it there being something bigger, mm. I think that's that is part of one's human um, heritage experience. Mm. Well, we'll probably come back to this, but let's move on now through your life. Um, is there anything to say about your kindergarten? Apart from the fact you learnt English there, um, was yes. it was it in London? It must have been. It was. It was. There were a number of them, but um, one was in Oxford, actually, or in in, in um, <coughs> above Oxford. My mother and I, because my father was interned, my mother was uh, reliant on friends and relatives. She had no money, so we kept moving from one place to place to live with different people. One was in Headington in, in Oxford, and uh, I think that was my first one. I remember only that I, she trained me to go to the terminus of the bus where the kindergarten was. So I travelled on my own, aged three or four, <laughs> and it was cold. I can just remember and her, her singing um, to me. An English nursery rhyme, actually. Yeah. Um, and and then I went to the Anna Freud clinic in London, which was terrifying uh, because the children. I, I, I from after the event, I think because the other children were so disturbed, mm. um, and I didn't last there for very long. And then there was another one not far from there in London as well. So several, mm. but in all of them. Mm. And then you went on to some sort of preparatory school that was boarding or not? It was boarding, but it wasn't a preparatory school. It was my favourite school, which I do idealise, but but without hesitation. Um, it was called Bunce Court. 
Buns. Buns. B U N C E. Yeah. It was, it was a school that was, run by two German sisters, Anna and Paula Essinger, mm. who there was a television program about them because some fairly famous people went there. Uh, famous mm. Frank Auerbach, the painter, went there, for mm. instance, and uh, and it was a remarkable school in which they realized very early, in 1933, the, the year that Higgins um, was elected chancellor, um, that, uh, that this, you know, that they couldn't go on. Um, not because they were Jewish, they're Quaker actually, I think. Um, and so they arranged a school trip, telling all the parents that it was more than just a school trip, and they all agreed, and took all their pupils with them from Germany. Um, to to England and then found a, uh, having found a place for them to be in, hmm. uh, and that place was Bunce Court, which is a place in in uh, near um, uh, Lenham, Kent, hmm. and that's where I went. Only I didn't go there because by that time they'd been moved because it was needed. That house was needed for, yeah. for for the armed forces, and I and it was in in Shropshire. But yes, I went there. I was there for five years, and then the school went bankrupt. So I then had to move. But it was a co-educational, extremely strict in academic terms, but very progressive in, in other respects. Do you remember, were there any teachers at that stage who, who inspired me? No, except Paula Essinger, mm. who, was one, who was very strict with us. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and then you went on from Bunce Court to? Uh, a rather grim school called Sherrod's Wood. In Welling Garden, in, in Welling, uh, mm. the main school was in Welling Garden City, but the mm. boarding place was in Welling, um, where, which was also co-educational, um, and where I sort of got on. But it was the first time that I came across anti-Semitism and anti-Germanism, mm. and I didn't suffer from it very much because I was fairly able to stand up for mm. myself and the. Um, but uh, one of my best friends, curiously, was the most anti-Semitic and anti-German, Michael Walter Kelly, whose parents were in the Fabian Society, and he was—he and I were the only two boys who could match the girls, although they were, it was always girls on the top of mm. the class. Mm. Um, but we could get sort of second and third, as it were, mm. um, and. And we became sort of hostile friends. It was mm. a curious relationship. And he teased me for being German and, and then occasionally for being Jewish. And mm. that's, that was that school. And then I went to Gordonston, which is. Did you? Yeah. Oh. Um, where I got a scholarship. I mean, I was my mother, whatever. It, um, what was it called now? Anyway, they, my mother couldn't afford the fees, so they paid towards them. Mm. And. Uh, and I was there for the last four years of my school. Academically, a disaster. Really? Total disaster. Why that? Um, just because the teaching wasn't very good. Mm. Um, it, I mean, in terms of it being a great place for the outdoors life, it, it was. I, mean, I really enjoyed the mountains. Mm. Um, but I, I felt deeply. Um, Frustrated by the school. Um, frustrated in the sense that they kept on telling us we were being prepared for life, and I wanted life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, prepared for leadership, which I didn't want either. Mm. Were you already showing a particular interest in any kind of intellectual? At that time, mm. I wanted following my mother's interests to either be a psychiatrist or, this is my fancy, pure fancies, both of them, to be a journalist. I felt I wanted to be a journalist. I felt, and that, that was an anthropological instinct, I realized. I just wanted to be able to tell stories about other people. And, um, and I had my, English was my best subject and uh, I was, the, the teacher was the headmaster, uh, the 
teacher of English. And I really, he, he was something I remember well. Because what, do you remember his name? Bratton. Mr. Bratton. I forgot the Bratton. 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 B R E R A T O N. And he taught Browning, Robert Browning, hmm? who I, I, I mean, taught me to love Robert Browning. Hmm. But it wasn't to, I mean, I had to do it for O levels and A levels, but I, I just, he, he gave a real, um, I don't know, a sense of enjoyment mm. about it as well, which I picked up. Mm. And and uh, and he also taught us um, quite. I th now think quite. I, mean, I remember reading a, not just Shakespeare, but reading Granville Barker on Hamlet and various mm. other things as well for my A levels and. I think that was quite good, I, although I didn't do at all well at the A levels. I did maths, French, and English at A levels, and failed. No, I got the A English, um, but failed the other two. Um, and then I joined the army because I couldn't get into university. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's go back to just. I mean, at school, were there any other activities? I mean, you said you were quite tough and so on. You. Keen on games? No, I, I, long distance running, yes, mm. but uh, but I didn't particularly enjoy it. Mm. And no one I really did enjoy, and it became a habit of life, mm. was being in the mountains. Mm. I, I, I loved my mm. um, It was it was quite it, that was quite tough. I mean, it was mm. very cold. Rock climbing or no walking? It was just walking mm. in the Cairngorms though, and the Cairngorms mm. are very poor mm. and very cold and windy. Mm. Um, and I learned to ski as part of the expeditions in the winter into the Cairngorms. And, I, and then I, on one run, I uh, hit some ice and, and broke the ski and my and tore a ligament in my knee, and didn't ski after that at all. But, <laughs> but, but, it, but I enjoyed it. I, I, I must say, I felt quite gripped by the mountains. What about other things like uh, music or? Yes. Thank you for asking that. That was very important. Mm. I I had learned the violin from a very early age. From I think I must have been eight when I started. And at Gordonston there was a very good teacher. She herself was a Frau Lachmann was her name, and she had been the the student with Hindemith, the composer, mm. who was a viola player. How do you spell her name? Lachman, L-A-C-H-M-A-N. Mm. And uh, I know I, I know her given name because other people from later in life told me she was called Susie Lachman. Mm. Um, the but but uh, I think I just called her Miss Lachman. Mm. Well, maybe we all called her Frau Lachman. I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, she was very fierce teacher of, of violin, and then I took up the viola. Uh, that's why I know about him and his mm. being a viola player. And we played, I played in the orchestra as a viola player and, and, uh, and played chamber music. Mm. And that was, that was a, a glorious experience. I, you know, I, I, had, I gave that up too when I got to Oxford, but, the, um, but it was a glorious experience. I just was never good enough to really keep going. Mm. But have you continued to love music? Or yes, yes, absolutely. What, what in particular? Well, I think by the time I had left school, when I was at school, my closest friend at, at Gordonston was a man, was a Hungarian called Istvan Horti, grandson of the Admiral Horti who won Hungary in the, in the war. Um, and he and I listened to Mahler symphonies. Um, I remember just on our own in the study that we had. Um, and I could hear others who were playing things like um, Salad Days <laughs> and, and, uh, and traditional jazz, which I didn't like. I thought it was just too uninventive, mm. at least what they played. But as soon as I left, I got very interested in modern jazz, and almost exclusively so. And then 
got back into classical music again. Mm -hmm. Do you, some people write to music or yes, add I, to music? I, I, I know it's wrong, but I do. <laughs> um, I have a. I know I should really be listening because mm -hmm. this is you know, this is something that could be quite deep. But mm -hmm. I, um, but I do I do actually. Uh, now I don't so much, but I did most mm -hmm. of my life. I have done. You know. Well, Simon Schaffer, who I interviewed, mm -hmm. uses music as a kind of wall around him and plays it fairly loud around him, and that deadens deadens everything else. Deadens everything else. And yeah, and he writes to music. Yes. Like that. But some people use it, I mean, listen to it, and then write to to be inspired by the strong emotions it churns up. I think for me, it's when I when I'm writing, I get in some ways hyperactive. I, I, what I'm doing excites me too much, and I, it's it's almost as if I want to get away from it, mm. which I can then use if I've got music on. I can then listen to the music and then get back to what I'm writing. Mm. Um, or make a cup of coffee, or whatever. But the 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 music in itself isn't usually an inspiration. Mm. Mm. So you went into the army. I was conscripted. I mean, you can, yeah, so yeah. I was in the last years of the national mm. national, the national service. service yeah. Yes, and that was that was uh, not a terribly formative, but a vivid experience. Mm. Um, I I was. Um, I went in for officer for the tests for officer training and failed them, which I'm extremely pleased about. <laughs> um, I mean, pleased because I think it would have been horrible to be cooped up in a in an officer's mess. Um, and um, the in, in, it would have been too much more like boarding school. I mean, there are other aspects in which my boarding school experience meant that I didn't suffer as much from having to live in barracks as mm. some of the others did. But um, the but I lived for a whole year in all the shot of all places, mm. right? I mean, <laughs> learning to type. I went in the army service course and I learned shorthand typing. Mm. I was shorthand writing and typing. Um, and and uh, that was I think one thing was really very good about that was that I met a huge variety of people. I mean, ordinary people that I would never have met otherwise. And the only similar experience I get now is if I have to go into hospital, you know, <laughs> in a public yes. ward. Mm. Um, but the at that time, I just met people who were, um, I don't know, from all walks of life, but mainly working class. Mm. And and. Uh, and, and I wouldn't have ever been able to know how to get on with them. I mean, now our children went to comprehensive school, which mm. was so they get, they had that experience for much longer than I did. But I had it for those two years, mm. and then I went into uh, I got a position. I dreaded being sent to Germany, actually, because uh, not because it was Germany. Mm. Uh, but I I wanted to be in the intelligence corps. Mm. <laughs> I sort of said to. <laughs> to the to the person I had to report to, to on conscription, that was my aim. He said, "Ah, yes, but you have to join another one first, which was no doubt a way of just easing me out of it um, uh, to the Royal Army Service Corps." But I'd wanted to, um, I don't know, the glamour of being in, in, in intelligence of some kind. And I know then when I got to Oxford, I met people who had done Chinese while they were in the mm. services as part of being in intelligence. And I didn't know why, quite what it was, but I'd wanted it and it didn't happen. And going to Germany was just actually having to make so much effort at looking smart to get out into the town uh, that I, I was told that I, you know, it was dreadful to go there mm. because you, you could never get out of the barracks. Um, and I got instead uh, posted to Stanmore in London, um, <laughs> where I was deputy the personal assistant to the deputy director of army legal services, a, mm. you know, a, a slightly elevated uh, typist, and I typed out charges to <laughs> for, for other poor soldiers and <laughs> sh to mallet and other <laughs> places like that. Yeah. And so, and in the meantime, I lived at home. 
and put on the uniform once a week to collect my pay. And in the <laughs> meantime, went to the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, where I learned. Did you? Yes, Where's because I wanted to do composition. Sarah went there too. My right. wife. My wife. Did she? Right. She'll be and I got interested in acting there as well as in composition. So, hmm. so that that was that was. It seems a very light regime that you just have to turn up once a week in the uniform. And the rest. I of had the time to turn up all the other time in ordinary clothes. Oh, I see. <laughs> uh, but well, how did you do the guild hall as well? In the evenings. In the evenings. It was the evenings. Hmm. Yeah. And I I wasn't registered for a degree. I just wanted to do the classes. Hmm. And, and I wanted to compose. By that time, I got interested in jazz, and I met there a jazz uh, a saxophonist in America. Mm -hmm. And he, he was a much more accomplished composer than I ever mm -hmm. was. So I wrote, we did a cantata, and he did the music, and I did the words, mm -hmm. which was uh, never published and won't ever see the light. <laughs> but it was, it was it was really about nuclear holocaust, mm. um, and uh, it was about ash, mm. radio radioactive ash, and many other things. Like that, that sort of desperate, beautiful world, mm. and um, and uh, at that time I came quite closely connected with the beat generation that was in Paris. Mm. Went to Paris afterwards and met people like um, William Burroughs, and, mm. um, and I'd got very interested in the poetry of Gary Snyder. Mm -hmm. And Gary Snyder is a sort of anthropologist. Uh, mm. Anyway, we well, sounds if you're writing if you're writing about Ash and so on, you're vaguely already quite political. No, on the contrary, uh, very very unpolitical. Just. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was, I'd was i become interested in anarchy, actually. I, I, I read quite often the journal called Liberty, was it? Or anyway, a serious anarchist journal. Mm. Um, um, and I, I, quite, I was quite taken with it. But my interest was poetry, just poetry and art. That's mm. it. And when I went to Oxford, I went to do Chinese. I mean, I went to do English, but I changed before I went there to do Chinese. Mm -hmm. And and I got into Oxford while I was in the army. Incidentally, I not only went to the Guild Hall, I went and did my college entrance from the army. And, and they took you in with one A lot. Yes, mm -hmm. but on on the basis of the college entrance and the interview. Mm -hmm. And I had extra Latin lessons in university mm -hmm. college to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, did I have to take O level? In? I'd already done O level in Latin, but I needed to do some extra because they tested you on it. Why did you choose to do or change from English to Chinese? It, it was an act of, I guess, unacademic arrogance. Unacademic yeah. arrogance. I felt that I could learn what I needed to learn. Well, why China? I mean, had you started reading books about China? Or you I had. Chinese? I'd. I'd uh, Thames and Hudson had published a book by Alan Watts oh, yes. on Zen, mm -hmm. uh, The Way of Zen, it was called. Mm -hmm. And I was very taken with that. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd read Arthur Whaley's translations of Chinese poetry. And I'd um, realized that Zen was, I think, I must have realized already then was Chan mm -hmm. um, and linked to Taoism. And I thought, oh yes, so that's what I want to learn Chinese poetry then. Because I was interested in poetry as well. Mm. And, and, uh, and I felt that the, to do a course on China, you were, it didn't confine you to doing literature. You mm. did history, philosophy, uh, as well as literature mm. of China, but in any way. And I felt that if I wanted to become a writer, still possibly a journalist, um, I, I could do that on my own. That's why I meant it was arrogant. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and China was just more exotic. And it was. It was. A, it was sheer of exoticism. <laughs> um, so, how was your Oxford time? Were there 
significant people? Or yes, there was a very, very active violence there. Um, the most significant person for, at Oxford for me, academically, was David Hawkes. The, he was uh, not exactly my tutor, but he helped me a lot. My, the, the, my tutor was a, was a man called Wu Shi Chan. Uh, How do you pronounce it? Spell that? Wu, W-U, mm -hmm. and then Shi, S-H-I, C-H-A-N-G. Which Who college were you at? Queen's College. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And w but Wu Shi Chan wasn't at Queen's, I don't know what college he was attached to, actually. Um, but I had tutorials, most of my tutorials were with him, for, for the main, my specialities, which was poetry, mm -hmm. tongue poetry. And um, and he wasn't a tongue poetry expert. His expertise was in the story of the stone, mm. uh, the Hung mm. um, And uh, But David Hawkes was the translator of the story of the stone. Mm. A fantastic translation, The Penguin. Mm. And I recommend it to anybody. Mm. Um, and, uh, and he he led me to my first publication, I come to think of it, in my field. He, he'd been asked by a Ming collector, a ceramics collector, to translate a poem on a certain kind of bowl, a certain kind of ware, blue and white ware, for an article to be published in Oriental Art. And he said, well, I won't do it, but I'll give it to one of my students. And he gave it to me. <laughs> I was only in, I think, beginning of my third year or something. Mm -hmm. you know, only a three-year course, mm. but it was a, it was a, it was a fantastic thing to be able to do. And so this was a Redcliffe's so uh, so it's a kind of poetry mm. by Sudan Pope, which and there's a lot of Redcliffe ware. Mm. Um, so that was my first publication. I, I in, in, in Oriental art, I did mm. I, I published the, the whole of the poem. I, I, I mean, translated the whole of the poem. So. Uh, uh, and David Hawkes disappeared. I mean, he just he completely disappeared in my last year because um, he was dis he decided that in order to work on the translation of the story of the stone, he had to stop teaching, mm. and, which was thoroughly admirable. I think. I mean, you know, just <laughs> go away and do it. Mm. And but but he I liked. He and Wu Shichang were my two main influences. Mm. Did you come across Anne Lonsdale at all? Yeah. No, the names. She was mistress of Newhall here. And she specialised at, at Oxford in Tang poetry, um, but she was probably a little younger than you. Yes. She's just retired, so she must be in her late sixties now. Right. Um, no, I didn't. Come and she go to? She went to China. Her interview, which I've done, mm. um, is very interesting about her early trips to China in the fifties and sixties. Right. Um, but I thought you might have seen. Them. No, the people I was at Oxford with was the, by far the largest year of students doing Chinese. It was eleven of us, and this was in 1958. So mm. it's really very large uh, for that time. And I don't think it was equal for another 10, 15 years. I don't quite know why it was mm. such a big year. But was Mark Elvin there then, or not? No, he's younger. Mm. Um, John Gittings, the yes. man who became the editor, the one of the foreign editors of the Guardian, um, leader writers for the Guardian, mm. rather, um, and um, Bill Jenner, mm. the historian and translator of Chinese. They, mm. they were my two of my colleagues, mm. co students. What about all the other things one does at university? Oh, yes, a lot. I mean, the journalism poetry thing kept mm. going, and I want. I gave. A, I mean, I started to do. I tried to do too much. I wanted to play in uh, my viola, and I wanted to act, and I wanted to write. Mm. And the former two fell by the wayside. And writing, I, I, I wrote poetry on the poetry society. Um, was a, a beat or a beatnik in mm. my habits, mm. um, and. But I then, with a friend called Geoffrey Cannon, took over a journal in Oxford called Oxford Opinion, which was a pretty ropey, thin thing. And we wanted to turn it into something much more substantial. And 
and we did. Uh, it became, uh, we had photo essays, we had film criticism, we had news articles or you know, articles about places in which the sort of reviews of what was going on in whatever it was, in Africa or whatever, um, by people who were fellow undergraduates, but who were quite, quite well informed. Um, and and it and it was and completely redesigned it. So yes, we and I published some poems in that too. But the the um, I was mainly an editor, and and uh, and then we took it out of Oxford when we both left and tried to make it a, a national magazine. Uh, and that was a, tr a tremendous uh, time-wasting effort. Of getting advertising and mm. uh, stuff. It was called Evidence. Mm. Um, and we put out one issue and that was it. We couldn't keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> By this time, you hadn't encountered anthropology, presumably. You didn't have No, it. not at all. And, and, uh, um, and I went to work in the, in the Chinese bookshop um, just opposite the British Museum. Mm. Um, uh, was this after you went down, I mean? Yes. Hmm. Um, and uh, I went to work there uh, in, in the shop downstairs. The bookshop was run by a man called Charles Cohen, hmm. who, who, who not long after became a teacher of history, Chinese history, modern Chinese hmm. history at Sarah's. Um Anyway, I, I worked there for a year while I tried to produce this journal. Hmm. Um, and I had a friend who was uh, Malayan Chinese, and I felt, I don't know, partly through talking to him, uh, and just realizing it dawned on me after the, in the first year that I'd learned Chinese and I could read poems, but I couldn't speak. <laughs> and I couldn't understand Does speech. they not teach you anything? No, absolutely not. It was all <laughs> classical Chinese. And I thought, this is truly absurd. Mm. I really need to be able to get to China. I need to mm. be with Chinese people if I wanted to learn about China. Mm. And that's when I first found out about uh, doing anthropology because Morris Friedman was one of the two poles of a thing called the London Cornell Fellowship. Yes, I was a London Cornell right. scholar at one time. Right. That's how I went to Nepal. Yeah. And oh, I see. Right. Yeah. And and he he, uh, he there were there, there there were these fellowships. By that time, I was married with two children. By the way, mm. I mean we I mean, married while mm. I was still an undergraduate. Mm. And um, and the and I needed a fellowship if I was mm. going to go on try to get to China. Mm. And there were these fellowships that offered people with Chinese to become anthropologists or vice versa. Mm. Well, not necessarily anthropology, I think there was other mm. social sciences too. And so I, I applied and got the fellowship. Um, no, wait. No, the, no this, sorry, the crucial point is that I, he told me, Morris did, that I couldn't get the fellowship unless I did a master's degree in anthropology first. So then I registered to do anthropology at, um, at LSE. But I had, through doing Chinese, um, met the person that uh, I've mentioned to you earlier today, Robert Reedman, mm. who had been in the ambulance service uh, on the Burma Road. Mm and had learned Chinese, and he gave me his Chinese dictionary. But he was a kind of partner with, not in, with a man, mm. but not in an open homosexual mm. relationship, but in a close one, and they lived together. And the man was, 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 was Maitland Bradfield, who was a medical doctor, and to become interested in archaeology and in anthropology. I examined his PhD. Yeah. Right. 
on associations. On association. Mm -hmm. So it came out as that book, The Natural yes. History of Associations, yes. two volumes. Yes. Yes. And, and he um, became a kind of early mentor in anthropology. He'd already become interested in the elementary structures of kinship of, mm. of, of, of Levi Stills and had done his own translation and summary of it, mm. which he lent me. Mm. And, uh, and I'd already begun reading Tris Tropique, mm. partly as a literary work, mm. and found it deeply fascinating, and, and became, as it were, an anthropologist through Levi Stolz. Mm. And that became the sort of anthropological love of my life. It, mm. it became that which, which I, on which I, the sort of magic carpet I sailed on through the LSE as well. Mm. I mean, I wrote a great deal about Levi Strauss for Morris Friedman's classes, and he, he didn't quite catch on to Levi Strauss. <laughs> so that, um, he used to come into lectures and say, this is the latest Levi Strauss, and, and translate bits on the hoof, um, so to speak. And right. It's very enthusiastic, I remember. I went to some of his lectures too. But right. What date was this that you were? Uh, I was at the LSE 64 to 66. Yeah. And I worked at Thames and Hudson to pay my way through. Because mm. I wasn't yet, mm. didn't, hadn't got this fellowship yet. Mm. And I was working at Thames and Hudson as a picture editor and, and text editor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Were there any anthropologists uh, apart from, well, say something more about Morris because he must have influenced you deeply. Huge, yes. yes. Morris. Um, I, 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 like, I liked him and at the same time I felt a distance from him. We were so different, politically and in our, I don't know, dress sense. Mm -hmm. um, he always felt to me uh, Verging on the side of pomposity, he was on. He armoured himself in his waistcoat, as I think, <laughs> yeah. um, and and kept a distance between himself and his students. At the same time, he came over to the students mm. extremely well. Mm. Um, he taught fantastically well, mm. and and I enjoyed his seminars. And he and the other pole of the London Cornell Fellowship, uh, Bill Skinner, mm. he brought Bill Skinner over for a series of seminars he gave on his marketing systems theory, mm. which was just about to be published. And and that was a that was fantastic. That mm. that was I really felt uh, um, invigorated to, to really know mm. in a different way and about China in this way. As so effectively they became my two mothers of how to learn about China. Mm. But Morris's um, insistence on kinship and on the distinction between lineage and family, or kinship and family, and all those things, I learned, but I didn't want to do them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I learned them faithfully, mm. um, and felt that, well, I was more interested in friendship, and in territory, and in neighborhood. So I, I guess it was a kind of similar to what I did to, to my father. I just was anti-authoritarian. Mm. And, 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 uh, and, and respected him, and I know that he respected me despite the fact that he knew that my politics was terrible. <laughs> um, and despite the fact that at the LSE he stood at the gates and pointed people out who, uh, forget about that, but the, the, the um, and, and I didn't like him for that. Mm. But, but, but um, he had the, this, I think, admirable capacity to say, I don't know what, you know, I don't know what you're writing about. I don't, uh, you know, I, I, you're a good field worker, you did good field work, your theory is beyond me, I don't know mm. what it's all about, but I respect it mm. for what you do with it. And, um, and that... Was I, that when he was your PhD supervisor? When, it, when he was my PhD mm. supervisor, yes. Mm. And uh, I have a real respect for him. I, and. And, and I, th I hope I made that, um, I realized that in co-editing a festering for him after he died. Mm. Mm. Was there anyone else at um, 
I mean, it was a great generation. I came in the year you left mm. in '66, right? And it was just the end of that great era with Lafeuf and Lucy Nair and Robin Fox and so on. Mm. Was there anyone else there who particularly influenced you in the teaching? Yes, um, Stephen Morris was mm. my tutor, um, and I suppose because Barbara Ward, uh, mm. but. Yeah. Married to him, but but, he, but I, I mean, but yes, I I did I did. Uh, um, Stephen Morris again was a fairly distant person. I kept, mm. he kept a distance, but I I liked him, and he he. I don't know that there was something. Um, no, I don't know that there was anything apart from pluralism, which is mm. which I got from him. Mm. And Morris, also his first dissertation, mm. his master's dissertation, was on pluralism. Mm. Yes, he, he, mm. he used the, an early notion of pluralism for it. Um, I should say that I became later very interested in race, and mm. therefore, uh, therefore picked that up again. Mm. But um, the, the, so that, that's Stephen Morris, but um, no, I... I mean, of all the teachers, of course, I was very affected by the presence of Raymond Firth mm. and of Jean Lafontaine, but the but mm. Raymond Firth particularly, and sort of uh, the seminars, the Friday seminars, which unusually, I mean, certainly it doesn't occur now, master's students could attend, mm. um, and I, I did, and I didn't like the way in which he ran them. But that's the going round each person. Yes, and he had stereotypical notions of what each of us were. Mm. So he, you know, I call upon John Davis, our resident historian. He would say, <laughs> uh, uh, and so on. Mm. The the um, but 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 he was terribly good at allowing someone to say something and then making something of 